This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MD Edge Hematology Oncology. And I'm MD Edge editor, Mary Ellen Schneider, filling in today for Nick Andrews. Happy New Year. It's 2020, the start of a new year and a new decade. We wanted to start it off right with a look at the best of clinical correlation. Our special segment from Hematology Oncology Fellow, Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. Each week, Dr. Yerkowitz brings us her insights into the human side of hematology oncology care. She kicks off this best of episode with a discussion about what the word cure means to doctors versus patients. I'm Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology care. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a word. I've been a fellow in hematology and oncology for a little over six months now, and there's one word I noticed I use a lot less than I expected. That word is cure. Instead, we use a lot of other terms. We talk about NED or no evidence of disease. We say someone is in remission. We analyze data with outcomes like PFS or progression-free survival. To us, these are more accurate, nuanced terms to capture the reality of a person's illness. I've noticed that for patients, however, it can be confusing and not at all reassuring. Because the reality is, even if scans show no evidence of disease, even if someone is in remission, there still is a chance there's microscopic collections of tumor cells quietly replicating. There's a chance the cancer can still come back. And that is an understandably terrifying reality. Every ache, every abnormality on blood work can invoke anxiety until they hear that magic word, cure. What I've learned about that point is actually that it's a bit arbitrary. Since cancer is more likely to return closer to the diagnosis, after a certain number of years in complete remission, we do say that someone is cured. But why five years, for example, and not six? It's based on probabilities and is not a hard line. I found that it's always better to be specific about what the terms mean. It can be an uncomfortable reality, but it's better than the alternative, which is false hope. So for patients, I would encourage everyone to really ask their hematologist or oncologist what the goal of treatment is and what is the likelihood of being cured, completely cured. And if they start using terms that you're not familiar with, it's more than okay to ask for clarification. Oncology lingo can be a language in itself, and it takes time even for those training in the field to fully appreciate what these terms mean. I wish I could say the word cure more. While I'm wishing, it would be nice to be able to cure more. But being honest and straightforward is ultimately the best we have for now. We're not trying to confuse you, but if that's what's happening, please do call us out on it. My name is Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. Today, I'd like to tell a story about chaos and about opportunity. A 50-something-year-old man with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer comes into the hospital because of an enlarging fluid collection in his lungs. He's admitted to the inpatient oncology team, comprised of four resident physicians, one fellow physician, and an attending. While in the hospital, he develops other complications, including kidney failure and altered mental status. The nephrology team comes on board. So does psychiatry. So does palliative care. Each team has anywhere between two and five doctors. He gets sicker, unfortunately, and goes to the ICU. He meets an ICU fellow, three daytime resident doctors, one nighttime resident, and an attending. It's a week later, and the ICU team switches. New attending, new fellow, some new residents. He's now ready to leave the ICU, but the inpatient oncology service is capped with the maximum number of patients, so he goes to an internal medicine team. Four new doctors there. 
Meanwhile, the nephrology attending changes and the palliative care team rotates. Now it's time for discharge to a rehab facility, so the physical medicine and rehab team is consulted for an evaluation, a resident and an attending, two new doctors. He's been in the hospital for a little under a month, and he's met and been under the care of about 50 physicians. So was it any surprise when my attending switches over, but our patient kindly requested to me not to meet him because, as he put it, I can't meet any more new doctors? There's a haunting, relatably accurate scene in Paul Kalanithi's incredible book, When Breath Becomes Air, when the author, a neurosurgeon with stage 4 lung cancer, becomes extremely ill in the ICU. He writes, I was in pain, floating through varying levels of consciousness, while a pantheon of specialists was brought together to help. Medical intensivists, nephrologists, gastroenterologists, endocrinologists, infectious disease specialists, neurosurgeons, general oncologists, thoracic oncologists. During lucid moments, I was acutely aware that with this many voices, cacophony results. And later, he wrote, I desperately wished Emma were there, in charge. Suddenly, she appeared. Emma was now the captain of the ship, lending a sense of calm to the chaos of this hospitalization. Emma was the name of Paul's oncologist. In my patient's case, the primary oncologist had coincidentally been out of town for just a few weeks, hence the cacophony that resulted. I tell this not to be critical of healthcare and the many physicians who are working incredibly hard to care for this patient, but as a reminder of the power of our position and how to best take advantage of it. An oncologist is in an incredibly privileged position of knowing her patient really, really well. That means being there for him or her for the duration, inpatient or outpatient, ICU, medicine team, or oncology team. That one person makes a huge difference when they take charge of a patient's care. I am honored to work with colleagues who take that seriously. I'm Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. Here's a story of a patient I'm sure we've all met many times. Imagine she's in her mid-60s with a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer. She initially did well after a lumpectomy, radiation, and chemotherapy, but then relapsed with metastatic disease and has now progressed through two lines of treatment. You discuss options for third-line treatment, and at the same time, you try to plant the seed for palliative care. There are a lot of phrases that may be used in a situation like this. We hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. We hope for a plan A, but also need to address a plan B. All of these phrases get at the same thing, meaning you're in a likely bad situation. While there's still a chance of a good outcome, there's a higher chance that the disease will continue to get worse, and we need to prepare for both of those possibilities. So now, this person is in limbo. She explores next-line therapies and hopes to be in the minority that responds, but also has to come to terms with her own mortality. That is her situation. She is suspended in a state of chronic uncertainty, having to hold two seemingly conflicting ideas together at once. I've occasionally heard overly simplistic remarks about people like this when they're trying to get next-line treatment, for example. It's as though they, quote, don't accept their reality or, quote, don't understand the seriousness of their disease. But that's often not the case. I've learned it's possible, and sometimes even preferred, to hold those two ideas in one's mind at once. Most of our patients are doing this all the time, and much longer than the 20-minute window we might see them in clinic. They are living this harsh reality. They have accepted this chronic state of limbo. Those two seemingly conflicting ideas? The truth is, they're not in conflict. They are not mutually exclusive. Hoping for the best and preparing for the worst are compatible beliefs. I can't emphasize how important it is for us as providers to accept that nuance too and to meet our patients there. I'm 
I'm Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. I'm going to get a bit on my soapbox today and talk about a statement I've heard many times from well-meaning, often less experienced providers, but sometimes also experienced providers. It comes up during a critical transition when we no longer have chemotherapy or immunotherapy options for a patient with advanced cancer, and the goal is to discuss palliative care and or hospice. The statement that I've heard so many times goes something like this. I'm sorry, but we don't have any more treatment to offer. This is problematic. It's problematic not just because it can signal abandonment, suggesting to a patient that their own doctor is giving up on them, but also because it's not true. Those who use that statement are really saying we don't have any more cancer-fighting treatment to offer, but we do have treatment. Palliative care is treatment. It is standard medical care focused on symptoms and quality of life. It's medications for pain, for nausea, for shortness of breath, and it's a philosophy that can be compatible with cancer-fighting treatment or a choice that we make when we no longer want to use or have cancer-fighting treatment available. And there's data even that a palliative approach to therapy can improve not just quality of life, but even lifespan. I'm hoping we as a medical community and educators can retire that phrase, and with it the school of thought that says if we're not giving chemo, we're no longer treating the patients. I'll end with a brief anecdote that I think captures exactly why this statement can be so problematic. After a well-meaning resident used the phrase with a patient with advanced cancer, she asked with astonishment, so no more oxycodone for my bone pain? No more Zofran when I'm throwing up? And of course, the resident was quick to correct and reassure her that, no, no, of course, we would still be offering all of those things. Of course, treatment takes forms outside of chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Of course. I'm Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. Today, I want to talk about reclaiming a term. When I was earlier in my medical training, I was taught not to say, I'm sorry, especially when delivering bad news. The reasoning? It makes it seem like it's your fault when you are the messenger. Two simple words, I'm sorry. Allow me to share some stories. I'm in the ER evaluating a 23-year-old with acute leukemia. He has no other medical issues, and he's never been in a hospital before. I'm sorry this is happening to you, I say. He thanks me. I'm in the ICU. A 72-year-old's lungs are slowly failing from advanced lung cancer and an infection on top of it. I'm sorry this is happening to your dad, I say to his daughter. She cries and hugs me. I'm in the clinic. A CT scan on a 55-year-old shows that her cancer, which has been stable for the last three years, has now progressed. She doesn't know what to say. I'm sorry, I say. She nods, thanks me, and asks about next steps. These are just a handful of anecdotes where I've said I'm sorry. I share these stories not to say what a good job I did, but because the phrase I'm sorry sometimes gets a particularly bad rap in oncology. I'm devoting an entire segment to it because I think it's actually an effective, empathetic phrase that I wish we were taught is okay to use more often. None of my patients seemed to think that my apologizing meant that their cancer was my fault. I'm sorry doesn't mean I'm sorry I did something wrong. It means I'm sorry the circumstances are what they are. My patients appreciated the empathy and felt supported. To all my patients who are struggling, I'm sorry you are dealing with whatever you're dealing with. To my fellow providers, I hope we can reclaim a phrase that doesn't showcase faults, but emphasizes our shared humanity. And that concludes this special episode of Blood and Cancer. If you want to hear more from Dr. Yerkowitz, 
Come back next week for a brand new clinical correlation or go online to mdedge.com slash hematology dash oncology and check out her regular column, Hard Questions. Blood and Cancer is hosted by Dr. David Henry. Clinical Correlation is written, recorded, and produced by Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. Nick Andrews is our audio editor, audio engineer, and the voice of MD Edge Podcasts. All MD Edge Podcasts are produced by executive editors, Kathy Scarbeck and Denise Fulton, and multimedia editor, Terry Rudd. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Thanks for listening.